You're listening to Deep Breaths, updates from Chest on ReachMD. This series is produced in partnership with the American College of Chest Physicians and is sponsored by InsMed Incorporated. Here's your host, Dr. David Griffith. Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, lung disease is becoming more common with annual prevalence increasing 8% per year. The treatment of MAC lung disease requires a comprehensive care team supporting the patient throughout their journey to provide optimal treatment response and quality of life. Although the course of MAC lung disease is frequently indolent, uh, there is accumulating evidence that it can be associated with adverse outcomes, including increased all-cause mortality. Since managing these patients is often complicated, it's essential that clinicians understand the fundamental principles of MAC management and adhere to established guideline-based treatment strategies, which is why we'll be reviewing that today. Welcome to Deep Breaths, updates from CHEST on ReachMD. I'm David Griffith, and joining me are pulmonary nurse practitioner Amy Levenger from NYU Langone Health, and Dr. Tim Aximet, Associate Professor of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Mayo Clinic. Ms. Levenger and Dr. Aximet, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffith. It's my pleasure to be here today. And thank you as well, uh, Dr. Griffith. Uh, My pleasure as well. Let's start with you, Dr. Aximet. What factors do you consider when determining when to treat patients with MAC lung disease? I would share that this is a critically important question to the approach of those with MAC lung disease. The assessment, treatment, and follow-up longitudinal care of MAC lung disease patients requires a comprehensive approach and should not be rushed. Several elements of patient interactions are required for effective and best patient care. This holds true whether treatment is started or not. Some of those elements include effective communication with your patients and education. This education includes the natural history of NTM lung disease, what's known and unknown. We understand that in some instances, we can predict that there may be an increased likelihood for progression if there is fibrocavitary disease, low BMI, or smear positive disease. As importantly, the education also must include management of risk benefits. That is to say, is the benefit to be gained from treatment well worth any potential risks or difficulties with the treatment regimen? And this is a treatable disease. This should be articulated and endpoints and goals of therapy clarified at the front end a priori with the patients so everyone is on the same page. The treatment approach generally will have an intensity that matches or is proportionate to the amount of disease severity. So for example, if someone has mild disease, nodular bronchiectatic, but does warrant treatment, we may elect to start out with a thrice weekly triple drug guideline-based therapy strategy. If there is more advanced disease, for example, fibrocavitary disease, smear positive, in the setting of COPD or other pre-existing lung disease, daily therapy of triple drug therapy is required, as well as consideration of a parenteral use of aminoglycoside, generally amikacin. Along with this education also goes intensive amounts of monitoring not only with blood work and eye exams, but also hearing tests. The proportionality and cadence of these testing is really dependent on the treatment regimen that's specifically chosen, as well as any comorbidities that the patient may have. This also leverages the use of a multidisciplinary team. Pharmacists, well versed in these medications and need for monitoring can be very effective to share information with patients. They can explain potential drug-drug interactions and also guide patients with additional patient materials. Thank you, Dr. Axman. That is extremely helpful. Uh, I wonder if you might elaborate further 
on the importance of adhering to guidelines-based therapy and also re-emphasize a point that I don't think can be emphasized too much, which is the patience and persistence that's required on the part of clinicians frequently when deciding when to start therapy uh, for a MAC patient. Dave, again, this is another great question and an essential component to effective management of patients with NTM lung disease. This is one disease that needs longitudinal care, whether treatment is started or not. In some instances, the decision to begin treatment is delayed from the initial assessment for several months or a year or longer. Sometimes the therapy would be started initially and the first visit but oftentimes will require longitudinal care. What sometimes is a misconception is that the NTM that's found is dismissed and patients are lost to follow-up, in which case they come back to the clinic several years later with advanced progressive disease that will not uh, improve even with the start of guideline-based therapies. Thank you, Tim. Ms. Levinger? Once it's determined that treatment is the next best step, what are the goals of management for patients with MAC lung disease? So when initiating MAC treatment, it is important to discuss with patients what the goals are. And the goal of therapy is 12 months of sputum culture negativity while on this therapy. Patients should be educated that MAC is a treatable lung disease and that we would like treatment to control and prevent the progression of disease. We would monitor our patients with respiratory specimens for AFB culture about every one to two months until the sputum does convert to AFB culture negative, and then every two to three months until therapy is completed. In addition to this, we would follow the chest CT scans, as well as how these patients are feeling from a symptomatic standpoint. Patients should be educated that it is possible for the sputums to not convert to culture negativity and or that that the chest CT scans may not improve drastically while on therapy. This is an important aspect to reiterate because you don't want patients to become discouraged when when this may happen, and that our goal, as stated before, is that um, treatment would control and or prevent progression of the disease. The treatment would be individualized on a case-by-case basis, as we do always keep in mind quality of life during the antibiotic treatment for these patients, and we don't want our patients feeling more sick and having many side effects while taking these antibiotics. Ms. Levinger, when you when you talk about individualization on case by case basis, is that referring to adjustments in antibiotic doses and uh, schedules within the framework of the treatment guidelines? Yes, following the treatment guidelines is is essential in providing optimal outcomes. However, it may be um, altering and, you know, tweaking when or how these patients take the antibiotics, whether it's starting a probiotic if they have some GI um, upset and or if patients may need to take the antibiotics with food um, rather than um, on an empty stomach as they may tolerate that better. For those just tuning in, you're listening to Deep Breaths, Updates from Chest on ReachMD. I'm Dr. David Griffith, and today I'm speaking with pulmonary nurse practitioner Amy Levinger and Dr. Tim Axamet about treatment strategies for patients with Mycobacterium avium complex or MAC lung disease. Well, let's pick up our our discussion again with you, Dr. Axamet. While managing patients with MAC lung disease, how are you monitoring disease activity and what challenges might cause you to consider changing the treatment regimen? Uh, this uh, question of how to best monitor disease activity, in my opinion, is similar to the initial diagnostic criteria. That is, it's a compilation of an assessment of clinical symptoms, sputum microbiology, and radiographic abnormalities. Uh, in most instances, we expect patients to feel better, even if there are potential side effects from some of the medication. Although we would expect their symptoms to improve, 
their radiographic uh, abnormalities to stabilize and then have some improvement in their microbiology and potentially sputum conversion. The specific intensity and frequency of monitoring, including blood work, eye exams, and audiology monitoring then are really dependent upon what the treatment regimen is and whether or not there are any comorbidities that may increase relative side effects, such as bronchiectasis, sinus disease, reflux disease. And if those are uh, taken care of, oftentimes symptoms will improve independent of the response to MAC lung disease treatment. Ms. Bevinger, knowing that every patient is different, what are some of the more frequently reported side effects to medications for MAC lung disease, and how do you manage them? Some of the more important side effects we discuss are optic neuritis that would be due to a Thambutol. And in order to manage this, we have our patients um, have visual acuity and color vision monitoring every one to two months while on therapy. In addition, the patient should be educated that if they do notice any change in vision, um, they should stop the antibiotics and notify their clinician um, as well as their eye doctor. Further, hearing loss, um, which would be due to the macrolides. And in order to manage this, we do have our patients get routine hearing tests about every three months um, and or with any change in symptoms that may occur. Hepatotoxicity could be a side effect due to rifampin and macrolides. And we manage this by getting routine lab tests on our patients. In the beginning, while starting treatment, it would be every month. And then if the lab work does um, continue to be stable, we could space this out and do about every two to three months. Dr. Axmit, could you describe refractory MAC lung disease, how to identify it, for instance, and how to approach it therapeutically? When treatment is started, we generally will collect on a monthly or every other month basis additional sputum or microbiology if available. If sputum has not converted from culture positivity to negative, by six months, while on guideline-based therapy, we assign a label of refractory MAC lung disease. I would share that there is a caveat in that those individuals with fibrocavitary disease and larger disease burdens may take a bit longer to convert their sputum, even on daily therapy with or without a parenteral agent. In most instances, we would generally make an assessment whether there is any development of macrolide and or amicacin resistance and whether or not this is still uh, susceptible to macrolides, assuming that it was at the beginning of our guideline-based therapy. For those individuals with refractory lung disease, we, this becomes a more complicated approach and often requires referral to a specialist with expertise in approaching patients with refractory MAC lung disease in a specialized clinic. Before we close, Ms. Levinger, I'll give you the final word. What's your key takeaway on MAC lung disease? Well, I would like to reiterate again that um, it is important for patients to be educated that MAC lung disease is a treatable disease. And as Dr. Axkamet said, in my experience as well, once patients are on these antibiotics and they're closely monitored and um, frequent reassurance if they have any questions, um, these patients do start feeling better and are ultimately are able to live their quality of life. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So I want to thank my guests for joining me to discuss the treatment of patients with Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, lung disease. Ms. Levinger, Dr. Axumit, it was great having you both on the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And glad to be with you, Dr. Griffith, Ms. Levinger. Thank you. This episode of Deep Breaths, Updates from Chest, was produced in partnership with the American College of Chest Physicians and sponsored by InsMed Incorporated. For more resources on this topic, visit chestfoundation.org slash NTM. And to access other episodes of this series, visit reachmd.com slash chest, where you can be part of the knowledge. Thank you for listening.